Οικών Σπουδών α, από τα τμήματα α, Βυζαντινών και Νέων Ελληνικών Σπουδών του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου και το Τμήμα Ιστορίας και Αρχαιολογίας σε συνεργασία με τη Βυζαντινολογική Εταιρεία Κύπρου. Ε, να ευχαριστήσω ιδιαίτερα την ερευνητική μονάδα αρχαιολογίας α, για τη φιλοξενία στο χώρο εδώ απόψε. Ε, και να καλωσορίσω με τη σειρά μου τον ομιλητή μας, α, τον ομότιμο καθηγητή του Πανεπιστημίου του Cambridge, κύριο David Holton, που με μεγάλη χαρά δέχτηκε την πρόσκληση της συναδέλφου κυρίας Κοναρή να έρθει εδώ να μας μιλήσει ε, στο πλαίσιο της... στο πλαίσιο της δημοσίευσης αυτού του πολύ σημαντικού έργου, του τετρά, της τετράτομης γραμματικής, μεσε, ε, ε, μεσε, γραμματικής των μεσαιωνικών και ε, νέων ελληνικών. Ε, εδώ έχουμε κάποια φυλάδια. Στο τέλος της διάλεξης μπορεί κανείς χρησιμοποιώντας αυτόν τον κωδικό να αγοράσει το έργο με 20% έκπτωση. Λοιπόν, δηλαδή, ε, α, μ, δηλαδή, ναι, λοιπόν, θα το ανακαλύψετε, αλλά είναι 20% έκπτωση. Οπότε, ε, για όσους ενδιαφέρονται, ε, θα έχουμε εδώ και έχουμε βγάλει και άλλες φωτοτυπίες. Ε, θα εκμετωλευτούμε την γενεοδορία του κυρίου Χόλτον, τον ευχαριστούμε και γι' αυτό. Ε, και τώρα να παρακαλέσω τον πρόεδρο της Βυζαντινολογικής Εταιρείας Κύπρου, τον δόκτωρ Ανδρέα Φούλια, να α, έρθει για ένα σύντομο χαιρετισμό. Καλησπέρα σας. Η Βυζαντινολογική Εταιρεία Κύπρου είναι με μεγάλη χαρά που συνδιοργανώνει την αποψινή εκδήλωση. Καλωσορίζουμε τον καθηγητή κύριο Χόρτον και τους, και τους συνεργάτες του και τον συγχαίρουμε για αυτό το εξαιρετικό τετράτομο έργο που χάρισε στην επιστημονική κοινότητα και είμαστε βέβαιοι ότι αυτό θα αποτελέσει ένα ε, πολύ χρήσιμο εργαλείο για τους μελλοντικού ερευνητέ. Σας ευχαριστώ. Επιτρέψτε μου εμένα να παρουσιάσω τον ομιλητή. Ε, ο Ντέιβιτ Χόλτον είναι ομότιμος καθηγητής νεοελληνικής φιλολογίας του Πανεπιστημίου του Cambridge και ομότιμος ετέρος, σωστή μετάφραση του φελού, ε, του Selwyn College. Σπούδασε στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Οξφόρδης, από το οποίο έλαβε πτυχίο στις κλασικές σπουδέ και τη βυζαντινή και νεοελληνική λογοτεχνία. Αντικείμενο της διδακτορικής του διατριβής, την οποία εκπώνησε και πάλι στην Οξφόρδη, ήταν η κριτική έκδοση μιας έμετρης πρώιμης νεοελληνικής διασκευής του μυθιστορήματος ή διήγησης του Αλεξάνδρου, γνωστή ως Ρημάδα, η οποία δημοσιεύθηκε το 1974 στη σειρά Βυζαντινή και Νεοελληνική Βιβλιοθήκη του Μορφωτικού Ιδρύματος της Εθνικής Τραπέζης της Ελλάδος. Συνέχισε τις σπουδέ του στο Πανεπιστήμιο της Θεσσαλονίκης και ακολούθως εργάστηκε για τρία χρόνια ως ερευνητικός συνεργάτης στο Πανεπιστήμιο του Μπέρμιχαμ. Διορίστηκε λέκτορα της νεοελληνικής φιλολογίας στο Κέιμπριτς το 1981, από το οποίο αφιπρέτησε το 2013 με το βαθμό του καθηγητή. Η έρευνα και οι δημοσιεύσεις του επικεντρώνονται στην ελληνική γλώσσα και την ύστερη μεσαιωνική και πρώιμη νεότερη ελληνική λογοτεχνία, ιδιαίτερα την κριτική αναγέννηση. Έχει ωστόσο δημοσιεύσει εργασίες και για τον Λορέντζο Μαβίλη, τον Ψυχάρη, τον Καβάφη και τον Γαζαντζάκη. Αναφέρω ενδεικτικά τα βιβλία του Ερωτόκριτος του 1991 και μελέτες για τον Ερωτόκριτο και άλλα νεοελληνικά κείμενα του 2001 και τον συλλογικό τόμο Literature and Society in Renaissance Greece, Crete, τον οποίο επιμελήθηκε. Υπήρξε ακόμα ο εκδότης 20 τόμων του περιοδικού Κάμπος, Cambridge Papers in Modern Greek και μαζί με τους Peter Μάκριτς και Irene Φιλιπάκη Βέρμπερτον συνέγραψε δύο γραμματικές της Νέας Ελληνικής οι οποίες μεταφράστηκαν και στα ελληνικά. Από τις πιο πρόσφατες δημοσιεύσεις του αναφέρω και πάλι ενδεικτικά τα άρθρα uh, The Role of Translation in Early Cypriot Literature 
πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον άρθρο που ήταν η ανακοίνωση που έκαμε σε συνέδριο που διοργάνωσε το ΒΝΕΣ έτσι στην Κύπρο, στη Λευκοσία το 2012. Ένα άλλο άρθρο που συγκρίνει Κύπρο-Κρήτη, The Renaissance Literature of Crete and Cyprus, Looking Back Over 40 Years, δημοσιεύτηκε το 2016 και το 2018 σε ένα συλλογικό τόμο δημοσιεύτηκε ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον άρθρο για την διαμονή του Νίκου Καζαντζάκη στην Αγγλία και ιδιαίτερα στο Cambridge το 1946. Ακόμα αναφέρω την επιμέλεια του τόμου μαζί με τη Σελένη Παπαργυρίου και Σεμέλια Άσιντα του συλλογικού τόμου Greece in British Women's Literary Imagination το οποίο βρίσκω συναρπαστικό, έτσι, 1913-2013 ένας αιώνας δηλαδή α, παρουσία της Ελλάδος στην, α, στο συλλογικό ασυνείδητο θα λέγαμε των Βρετανών γυναικών Επιπρόσθετα από το 2012 μέχρι το 2016, ο κύριος Χόλτον υπηρέτησε ως πρόεδρος της Society for Modern Greek Studies του Ηνωμένου Βασιλείου και τον περασμένο Αύγουστο, παρακαλώ, τιμήθηκε επαξίως από τον Περιφερειάρχη Κρήτης για τη σημαντική συνεισφορά του στη διάδοση του κριτικού πολιτισμού. Τελευταίο, αναφέρω το εξίσου σημαντικό ερευνητικό πρόγραμμα, το οποίο διεύθυνε και από το οποίο προέκυψε η Cambridge η γραμματική δηλαδή της Μεσαιωνικής και πρώιμης Νεοελληνικής του Πανεπιστημίου του Cambridge. Το τεράστιο αυτό έργο, το οποίο πραγματικά συμπλήρωσε ένα μεγάλο ερευνητικό κοινό, ε, κενό, δημοσιεύθηκε τον περασμένο Απρίλιο από το Cambridge University Press σε τέσσερις τόμους και γι' αυτό θα μας μιλήσει ο κύριος Χόλτον απόψε. Παρόλο που γνωρίζω την τέλεια γνώση του και την άψογη προφορά του της ελληνικής, Περιμένω με ανυπομονησία να ακούσω στην ομιλία που ακολουθεί και τις επιδόσεις του στους δεδάλους της προφοράς της Κυπριακής Διαλέκτου. <laughs> Κύριε Χόλτον. Καλησπέρα σας. Ε, πρώτα απ' όλα θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω θερμά την κυρία ε, Κοναρή, ε, Νικολάου Κοναρή, όχι μόνο για τα καλά της λόγια τώρα, αλλά και για την αρχική πρόσκληση να έρθω στην Κρήτη, μαζί βέβαια με την υποστήριξη του Τμήματος Ιστορίας και Αρχαιολογίας του Πανεπιστήμιου. Επίσης, θέλω να ευχαριστήσω το Τμήμα Βυζαντινών και Νεολικών Σπουδών και την Βυζαντινολογική Εταιρεία Κύπρου που συνδιοργανώνουν την απόψηνή εκδήλωση. Λοιπόν... Um, the Cambridge Grammar of Medieval and Early Modern Greek was published by Cambridge University Press in April this year, as you've just heard, and the electronic version will appear very soon, and it will be cheaper than the printed version. <laughs> It's the result of a large-scale research project which began in 2004 and involved six scholars, all of whom participated in the drafting of the chapters, Uh, which make up the four-volume work. The grammar focuses on the period from circa 1100 to circa 1700, but includes some data from texts before and just after those dates, and also, where possible and appropriate, summarizes developments in the history of the language from late antiquity to the beginning of our period. Our sources naturally include literary texts belonging to various genres. The editions used number about 360, but we've also made extensive use of non-literary texts, documents of all kinds, religious and educational texts, letters, portolans, medical and mathematical works, collections of proverbs, and so on. There is a vast amount of such material written mainly or wholly in the vernacular, which has not previously been fully exploited as linguistic evidence. Documents have a special importance for the historical grammarian because they're usually linked to a specific date and place. In the course of our research, we investigated more than 1,200 publications of such non-literary texts. A publication 
may contain a single document or letter, or it may be a whole notarial archive containing several hundred documents of every possible kind. In the event, almost half of these publications had to be eliminated uh, for various reasons, sometimes because the editions were unreliable, um, or the language had been tacitly normalized or modernized by the editor, or because they were 19th or 20th century copies of lost originals and therefore couldn't be trusted for the linguistic data, or simply because the language of those texts was very formal or archaizing and did not offer the vernacular features that we are particularly interested in. For each linguistic phenomenon we discuss, we give a selection of examples from literary and non-literary texts chosen to illustrate the chronological and geographical distribution, as well as the different text types and registers. To put it another way, we are concerned with diachronic and diatopic variation, and also with register variation. I must emphasize that we did not set out to produce a historical grammar of the Greek dialects. That would have been a very different undertaking. In addition to the written text which we've made use of, we would have needed an abundance of different kinds of more recent linguistic material. Although we do cite modern dialectal evidence in the course of our discussions, especially when it accords with the historical evidence culled from our texts, we've sought to avoid any teleological assumptions. In any case, there are unresolved issues about when we can describe the language of a particular text as dialectal, particularly when, as is often the case, the register varies considerably in the course of the text, and that applies to both literary and non-literary texts. For this reason, we normally talk about regional or geographical variation rather than dialectal variation. There are, however, three cases where the differentiation is clear enough to enable us to speak about dialects. Pontic, though the evidence for the medieval and early modern periods is extremely limited. Cretan, where there's an abundance of textual evidence from the 14th century onwards, and Cyprus. In this lecture, I want to make clear that I'm not going to be concerned with matters of lexicology, interesting though that might be, but rather with the grammatical and syntactic structure of the Cypriot dialect, and to a lesser extent, with its phonology. I shall first describe and discuss the Cypriot texts that were investigated, our corpus. I shall then examine some selected linguistic characteristics of these texts. Um, under four headings, these are the four headings. Uh, firstly, um, features that are not exclusive to Cypriot texts but are found in other regional varieties of Greek in the period that concerns us. Secondly, features that are found predominantly in Cypriot texts with only limited evidence from elsewhere. Thirdly, certain features that are indeed specific to and distinctive of uh, Cypriot dialect, the genuine Cypriot, exclusively Cypriot forms. And finally, some interesting cases of developments that may have started in Cyprus before spreading more generally. To conclude, I'll offer some thoughts about the current state of linguistic research on Cypriot texts dating from the 13th to the 17th century and suggest some desiderata for future research. First then, the texts. There are four substantial texts which are primary sources for the Cypriot dialect of the period that interests us, and of course you will be familiar with them. The oldest text is without doubt the Assizes of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and Cyprus, to give it its full title. The order of the two manuscripts edited by Sathas is dated 1469, while the other manuscript dates from 1512. It's tempting to date the original translation to the first century of Lusignan rule, given the importance of making the legal system known to all inhabitants of the island, 
but of course we can't automatically assume that the extant manuscripts preserve the original linguistic form of that translation. The Chronicle of the Sweet Land of Cyprus by Leondios Machiadas is of course a highly important text both historically and linguistically. The 1932 edition of R.M. Dawkins is still the only critical <laughs> edition available, though we do now have the very useful transcription of all three manuscripts produced by Michalis Pieris and Angel Nicolao Conari. The text was composed in the first half of the 15th century, but the manuscripts date from the 16th, or in the case of the Ravenna manuscript, the 17th century. The surviving manuscripts of the Chronicle of Vustronios are likewise from the 16th century, although the work was composed between 1456 and 1481. A transcription of all three manuscripts, together with an attempt at an edition, was published by Yorgos Kechaioglu. Also written in the 16th century, probably the 1560s, is the Venice manuscript containing mainly Petrarchistic poems in a variety of metrical forms. We refer to it as the Cypriot Canzoniere, adopting the term first used by Elsie Mathiopoulou Tornaritu. Apart from these four lengthy texts, we have a clutch of other works to which I shall refer briefly. Three of them are translations. The Fior de Vertu, preserved in one manuscript dated 1527 and another probably copied in the first quarter of the 16th century. The 1527 manuscript contains additional material which has been published separately uh, but it is in fact part of the same conduct handbook. We therefore treat it as a supplement to the Fior de Vertu and is referred to as Fior Sup. The other two translations are intralingual. Periton en Pisti Kekimi Menon is a, in a mixture of prose and verse and is attributed to John Damascene. The sole manuscript of the Cypriot translation is dated to circa 1550 to 1580. The other translation is the first eight chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, made by Ioannis Sancta Mavras and preserved in an autograph manuscript dated 1583. Finally, we have the Thrinos Kipru, dating from the 16th century, but preserved in a manuscript dated to approximately 1700, and a 17th century narrative poem by Constantinos Diakonos entitled Historia to Macaritu Marco. I've mentioned that we attach special importance to non-literary texts, such as documents and letters. Our corpus includes around 25 publications of Cypriot non-literary texts, edited by scholars ranging from 19th century dinosaurs, such as Sakelion and Papadopoulos Keramefs, uh, to leading scholars of the 21st century, Kurupu and Gein, Baglioni and Bayhammer. One hopes that more material of this kind will be brought to light and sensitively edited for its linguistic as well as its historical value. So moving on now to lit linguistic features that are not specific to Cypriot, though you might think they are. Some features of the modern dialect that are often cited as proof of its antiquity are in fact broadly medieval and may survive into the early modern period, 16th, 17th centuries, in various regions and indeed into other modern dialects besides that of Cyprus. To take just one example, the inherited ending of the third person plural in usi, um, present indicative and aorist subjunctive, is found in texts uh, from all regions in the period covered by this grammar. It's not simply a marker of learned usage, but an inherent feature of medieval and early modern Greek. The innovative ending, un, is first attested securely in the 10th century, but the old and new forms coexisted throughout our period, and not simply as metrical expedients uh, in verse texts, as is sometimes thought. 
The 1622 grammar of Germano records explicitly quel che altri dicono grafusi, li sciotti e altri molti dicono grafune. Um, so, what some people say, grafusi, uh, the people of, of uh, Chios, uh, and many others say grafune. We can find the two forms side by side in various texts. There's one from Crete, Echusi, Thelun, Nandalasun, um, and then the next but one, uh, a text which uh, comes, if I remember rightly, from Naxos, Thelusi, Vidun, Paradidun, Ke Pulusi. Cypriot texts also exhibit both forms though a recent statistical study indicated a predominance of un forms. Um, here are some of the un forms from older texts, one from 1300, osa yenun isaftus, one from the Assizes, anu then ertun, and one from Macheras, or two from Macheras actually, thelunechin, opu se koliun. And sometimes we find omission of final ni, Echu Neron, Scotonu set, both from Macheras. The corresponding past tense forms in Asi also have a, a, a similar coexistence uh, with the An forms uh, as permissible alternatives in all kinds of texts, both Cypriot and non Cypriot. Well, apologies for throwing a lot of examples at you. Um, I'm going to do it throughout this lecture, so <laughs> I'll apologize just once. Um, why do I do it? Uh, well, I'm not going to read them out, you'll be pleased to, to hear, nor do I expect you to, to, to read them all, but I w just want to make the point uh, that all uh, examples, all discussions in the grammar are illustrated with specific examples from uh, texts of various kinds. Um, it's important, I think, to document uh, the argument, not just um, state it without giving the, the evidence for our conclusions. And secondly, I wanted you to see how we refer to the text in the grammar itself, so that literary works are referred to by the author and a shortened form of the title. Non-literary works, um, documents and so on, are given a, a date where, whenever we can, um, like the one here from uh, 1300, uh, as well as the uh, geographical provenance and the name and date of the uh, publication. Geminate consonants, often cited as one of the defining features of Cypriot dialect. I leave aside the question of their actual phonetic status, since the historical evidence doesn't help us and it's none of my business. In historical terms, we must distinguish between inherited double consonants, which have not been reduced to a single consonant, as in most varieties of Greek, and what is con conventionally called spontaneous gemination. The first can't be detected in our texts anyway, because historical spelling doesn't reveal them. If you spell your, your Greek correctly, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about whether it's a single or, or a double uh, consonant. Um, only, conversely, only if etymological geminates are consistently written with a single consonant can we assume that degemination has taken place. However, the spontaneous doubling of intervocalic consonants can be detected when the relevant words are regularly spelt with a double consonant. Our texts contain many such examples. Skilla, I, I can't do the pronunciation, sorry. Potte, um, Epesen, Epesen, Mutin, and, and so on. Um, a number of examples uh, there. But the phenomenon of spontaneous germination doesn't only occur in texts of Cypriot provenance. We've gathered quite a number of examples from southern Italy and Sicily. You can see them there. 
um, and to a lesser extent, because the material is less plentiful, from the dodecanese where you would expect to, to find it. Um, examples there from uh, Rhodes and one from Patmos. There are indications that it was even more widespread in late medieval times, including areas such as Evia. The phenomenon is fully discussed in our grammar with attention to the different kinds of demination, the environments in which it occurs, and the consonants affected. One word that may exhibit gemination in the modern dialect of Cyprus is the universal quantifier ulos, ulos. I won't do a head count as to who would say which. Um, the form with U vowel is rather common in early Cypriot texts, though the inherited form olos also occurs. However, we haven't found instances with gemination in the texts of our period. Um, uh, it doesn't mean to say it didn't exist, of course. It simply isn't written down in any of the texts that, that we've studied. It's usually claimed that ulos... Uh, is a survival from ancient Ionic uh, rather than a later vowel change of O to U. If it is from ancient Ionic, then of course it should be written with, with uh, uh, a psilin, not with a dasia, because uh, the Ionic dialect did not have aspiration. But here are some examples of ulos from our uh, Cypriot texts Machieras, Vustronios. The Assizes, Fior de Vertu, the Cansoniere, and uh, at the bottom one uh, text, a uh, 17th century document, Tinacolutian uh, Muulin. So, Ulos is rather common in Cypriot texts, alternating with Olos, but it's by no means limited to Cyprus. We've found examples from Rhodes but also quite a number from Crete, as well as southern Italy, the Peloponnese, the Heptanese, and the Cyclades. In verse texts, it may sometimes be used to facilitate rhyme, but it's also found in other positions and in prose texts. There you see examples uh, stretching from 12th century southern Italy, Tovathos, Ulon, uh, right down to the early 18th century. Uh, that's the date... Um, of the manuscript of Erotocritos, uh, 1710, uh, Ulos, in Cornaros's work, and then from the early 18th century, uh, Chronicle of Galaxy, the Uli Tinalada, Suliti Rumeli. Our conclusion must be that Ulos has a rather wide distribution throughout the Greek speaking world as an alternative to Olos, and may perhaps be seen as a more emphatic form. A phonetic development found in specific morphological environments is the deletion of yod, y, after certain consonants. It occurs um, in the imperfect active and the present imperative of oxytone verbs like boro and lalo. Um, and some examples here will illustrate the phenomenon elalen instead of elalien, echrosten. Krateta, Ekraten, Bustronios, and a few more. Um, in this case, I don't know whether that's current in, in present day Cypriot dialect. You, maybe not. No? Elalen. Yes. Elalen, rather than Elalia. Yeah. Okay. In this case, too, Cyprus is not alone. We found instances in texts from southern Italy, the Heptanese, the Cyclades, and Macedonia. However, there is no single or simple explanation for the various instantiations of this development. It may be phonological, depalatalization if you like, but the possi possibility of an analogical process from the ending of baritone verbs cannot be excluded, or indeed it might be purely a graph graphematic phenomenon, simplified writing, if you like, spelling. Finally, in this section, I mentioned two features of modern Cypriot 
that were common to all regions in the medieval period. The retention of the unstressed augment is a standard feature of medieval Greek and indeed of several modern dialects, including Cypriot, I think. The earliest examples we have uh, of augment deletion after a consonant occur in written text dating from the 15th century. Uh, from the Polymos Distroados, uh, the manuscript is 15th century, din minisen instead of eminisen. And then a text of unknown provenance dated 15, uh, dated after 1427, Timas Thelan Dorsi, instead of Ethelan or Ethelan, just Thelan. So these are the earliest examples of the uh, omission of the augment, the, the, uh, the temporal, the, sorry, the, the syllabic augment. Um, even in the 16th century, deletion is not very common. Uh, most dialects, uh, most regional variation, re regional forms of, of, of Greek retain the, the um, augment right to the end of the period that concerns us. The second common feature is the order of verb plus clitic pronoun in positive declarative sentences. The normal order in medieval Greek is verb followed by clitic. Lalimu, as in modern Cypriot, rather than mulei, as in standard modern Greek. See, for example, this uh, late 17th century example from Naxos, Amazona Sintis, 1680. I won't offer further examples from our text because this syntactic phenomenon has been widely studied by scholars like Macridge, uh, Vyloskov, Papas, and there is an extensive section in the Cambridge Grammar written by Geoffrey Horrocks. Suffice it to say, that the change to the modern unmarked order of clitic before verb, except for imperatives and gerunds, seems to begin around the 16th century, but has not affected the Cypriot dialect yet. To sum up, in the six features I've examined so far, the Cypriot form has, has been shown to have a wider and sometimes general distribution in earlier centuries. Now I move on to features which are found predominantly in Cypriot texts with only limited evidence elsewhere. And I begin with the second person singular, personal pronoun, esu. <laughs> this, uh, th there is a good case for assuming that the u is an example of retention of the ancient Greek vowel, which in Attic Ionic became U with, with rounding, and by the 9th or 10th century AD became E, as in modern Greek SE. The forms SU and with a pherisis SU are common in literary and non literary Cypriot texts throughout our period and indeed in modern Cypriot. So here are some examples from texts going back to 1300, SU omnis, and so on, right down to. 17th century example, Kiesu uh, Ekratisesto. Um, a few examples of uh, the form have been found uh, in texts from southern Italy. Um, yes, there it is. To uh, Agoran Esu o Agorastis, a text, uh, 12th century text from southern Italy. However, it would be true to say that it's rare in late medieval and early modern Greek texts other than Cypriot ones, though I believe it is also found in the modern dialects of Carpathos, Icaria, and Simi. There are dialectologists here who can correct me. One development in medieval Cypriot that we could almost call classic is the merger of the accusative and genitive plural cases of masculine nouns and pronouns. A typical example is this one from Macheras, Istokadavin tus Veneticus, in the ship of the Venetians. I could provide dozens of further examples, 
representing a wide range of syntactic functions. Uh, the possessive genitive, as we've seen here in the Mahiras quote, also, I won't read them out, objective genitive, partitive, indirect object, ethic dative, a complement of prepositions or adverbs, and finally, direct object of verbs that in other areas normally take the accusative. This example from the Assizes, Uve na tu pistef sun uve ekinu uve tus siriendes tu. The last example shows clearly that the phrase tus siriendes tu is a genitive. In other words, it's not an accusative replacing a genitive, which would be a syntactic phenomenon, but a genitive in the paradigm of masculine plural nouns. And we see this clearly when a singular noun or pronoun or a plural noun of other genders is linked with a masculine plural noun or pronoun, as in the example just quoted. And here are a few more examples to drive home <laughs> the point uh, from uh, Assizes. Icrises tus thalasomachus ke ton navon. Ekinu ke tus kleronomus tu. Edo ken tus ten eleftherin, ekinus ke ton pedion tus. Ekinus is masculine, so it has the us ending. Ton pedion is neuter, so it has what we would regard as the genitive form. E pesen is tapodio tu kiulus tus amirades. Tapodia, the feet of him and of all the whatever they are. Um, <laughs> Am ombros tis kirasmu ke tus archondes. Attempts to explain this development as due to the influence of old French are, to my mind, unconvincing. What we have is a merger of the genitive and accusative, something which is also observed in the plural personal pronouns, emas, esas, and their clitic forms, mas, sas, and the third person, tus. From taspitia tus to taspitia tus frangus is a simple step. And from edocentus to edocentus cleronomus tu is, to my mind, even easier. It didn't happen only in Cypriot, though. We found a small number of examples in texts from Macedonia, Ceres, and the Crimea, would you believe it? And one from the 10th century even, Igumenos dismonis tus aius apostolus. Um, and the one from, uh, two from Ceres, in fact, Enoritis tus aius Theodorus. Istonaion iorion tus gunarades. This evidence suggests that the phenomenon may have been more widespread than our texts reveal. A type of verb characteristic of Cypriot is those that have the affix isk, krinisko, yeranisko, yinisko, and so on. And our texts contain a number of examples of uh, such verbs, kriniski, uh, eminisken, eyinisketon, and so on. But they're not exclusive to Cypriot texts. We've collected a few examples from Epirus and Macedonia, which indicate uh, that uh, there may at one time have been a wider distribution of such forms, at least in the spoken language. The testimony of uh, Romanos Nikiforu in his grammar of the 17th century um, suggests that the form Yanisko uh, was typical of the speech of the Vilanius, the peasant. Um, and that uh, supports the hypothesis that it was a matter uh, that it existed, but it, it was a matter of, of register. This is what he says. Um, uh, he, he, anos, he says, first of all, uh, but more, more commonly uh, and usually, ienose, instead of ienose, he's doing grammar. Or thirdly, what the peasant says, yaniskose, sanote, e yaniskase. Finally, 
in this selection of nearly exclusively Cypriot forms, we should include the periphrastic personal pronouns aftonmu, exaftonmu, etc. Leaving aside the thorny question of the origin of these forms, I will briefly illustrate their uses in our Cypriot texts. Most often they follow a preposition, so isafton, clitic and clitic pronoun, um, uh, endekedena yeni isafton do, to, to him, to himself. Um, we also have the form aftis and aftin, uh, isaftis mu, to me, um, isaftin in the in the canzoniere isaftisu means simply to you or to yourself. Um, with the preposition x, we get uh, often a combination of the two, um, and that can then follow another uh, preposition apo. So we have um, in the uh, first example, we just have ex aftondu, okay, and then we have apo xaftis with a, a, a clitic. We have from Machiaras apu xaftistus, uh, and more examples from Bustronios and Fior. This by no means exhausts all the possibilities. The meaning of the periphrasis is often difficult to work out. The forms have a wide range of variation, and in short, despite the existence of a recent study, more research is needed to clarify the origins and functions of the phrase. It's found predominantly in Cypriot texts, but a few examples have been found elsewhere, one in a Cretan comedy and one in a text of unknown provenance. There's the Cretan comedy, the, uh, well, it's not really a comedy, it's a, past, a pastoral uh, comedy, Pistikos uh, Voskos. Nakamo aftismu. Now, in the first case, the lack of a preposition distinguishes it from all the Cypriot examples. It probably functions here as an intensive pronoun, I myself. The second text is interesting because um, in that manuscript, uh, date, dated to the 17th century, the scribe habitually adds ni to the end of neuter nouns in ma, topraman, and so on, although the editor has unhelpfully removed it. I also found the allogu with uh, gemination in the apparatus criticus. Um, this is an astrological text uh, which should certainly be re-edited. It's interesting enough uh, I don't know whether it's interesting in astrological terms, but linguistically it certainly presents interest. Although it lacks consistent dialectal colouring, it's at least possible that the copyist was a Cypriot. Now, features that are really exclusive to Cypriot. I'm going to present seven features that are consistently present in Cypriot texts of our period, not found in texts from other regions. Actually, I should discuss five specific linguistic features and two absences. And I'll take the absences first, because absence makes the heart grow fonder. Um, here we are. Verbs in ano, from ancient Greek, normally reform their imperfective stem as en, alpha iota, a change that was already underway in early medieval Greek. Typical examples of the new forms current still in standard modern Greek are vareno, matheno, patheno, chorteno. But in texts that have a consistent Cypriot colouring, these verbs retain the stem in an, with possible gemination of the nasal, or are reformed in some other way. And here are some examples. Macheras, uh, again, sindichanomen, and, and manthanonda. Vostronios has also manthanonda. The canzoniere has vastano. Um, and the fior has hortani. The other absence in a Cypriot text is the demonstrative pronoun and dis determiner aftos. Though it's really a matter of its gradual disappearance over the period that concerns us. 
It's still fairly common in the Assizes, rarer in Majeras, and even more so in Vustronios. By the 16th century, it's become very scarce. Cypriot texts have tutos, or echinos, instead of aftos. Um, so we can observe the gradual loss of aftos as a demonstrative in the course of the period from the 13th to the 17th century. To move on to positive features rather than absences, the formation of, of comparative adjectives and adverbs in Cypriot presents some unusual features. In the synthetic forms, we often observe the spontaneous gemination that I've already mentioned, revealed by the spelling double taf. Or Dimitris Eton Askimoteros um, in Majeras. We can find quite a lot of, the, of those forms already uh, from the 15th century onwards. These uh, comparative forms with gemination are found only in texts from Cyprus. Also unique to Cyprus is uh, the adverb peritu, more, used to form analytic comparatives and superlatives of adjectives, as here, uh, peritu kaki, peritu gligoros, um, and peritu pelon, it's a nice one, yeah. But also with adverbs, etelis uno papas namati peritu kathara, um, or peritu platia, peritu anoris. Um, Toilette. Okay, thanks. Um, I mentioned peritu, despite the fact that I said I wouldn't discuss lexicological matters, because of its important morphological role. It, it's used to form the comparative and, and, and uh, superlative forms. Another lexical item that um, seems to occur exclusively in Cypriot texts is the adjective velipos, which functions rather like a contrastive determiner or pronoun, remaining, rest, other. In other southern areas, apodelipos is found, and indeed it occurs occasionally in Cypriot too. I apodelipi ista horia. 17th century text from Cyprus. In Cypriot text, however, the oxytone form velipos is quite common, as you see here. To velipon in Majeras, i delipi afendes, ta delipa fikia, and so on. Um, my next uh, case is. Uh, a type of masculine noun in Eos, which is not found except in Cypriot texts. Such nouns correspond to, and are presumably derived from, agent nouns in Tis. They occur uh, mainly uh, in the Assizes um, and have alternative genitives in Iu and Io. We have Opulitios, um, Odanistios, and so on. Genitives to pulitio or to agorastio, um, but also to pulitiu. They have um, an imparasyllabic plural, i empisteftiodes, um, but sometimes parasyllabic, uh, as in the last example before the asterisk, tus empisteftius. Lest such forms be thought to be confined to legal texts, here are examples from the Fior de Vertu, quite a bit later. Naisa dinatos ke vuthistios apetokormisu, and tu danistiu. A phonetic occurrence, uh, which has implications for morphology, is the shortened form ekin, or kin, of the demonstrative ekinos, occurring before a form of the definite article beginning with taf. 
Examples have been found in the Assizes and in the Canzoniere, a kind in Dimin, a kind in Caco Ergian. Um, masculine nouns, quintonilion, uh, neuter, tos, uh, quintos plachnos, plural, quinta armata, and so on. A parallel development with tutos has also been located in a Cypriot text, tun to charisma. Now, the technical term for this is dissimilatory haplology, um, the deletion of an element which is repeated in the demonstrative and in the article that follows. It also occurs in modern Cypriot, I hope yes. you agree, and possibly in some other dialects. But in the period that we're studying, it has only been located in texts of Cypriot provenance. The final feature exclusive to Cypriot, which I'll discuss, is the alternative form of the verb vido, vido, switching to the oxytone uh, conjugation. Examples range from 1300 to the 17th century, viditu, and so on. There are also two instances at the bottom of a passive form, vivite, uh, but you'll only find it if you look in the apparatus criticus uh, of the Fior de Vertu, since the editors have opted for the alternative reading. Um, I must say, we spent a lot of time in the course of our research with our noses in the apparatus criticus of, of text, the critico epomnima, because you find all sorts of things that um, the editor didn't like, but are pretty normal medieval or early modern Greek. Just if you read a text that doesn't have an apparatus criticus, you would know it was there. <laughs> so much then for the features which, according to our researchers, are found exclusively in Cypriot texts in the period covered by the grammar. We come now, finally, to a rather enigmatic category of innovations that first appear in Cypriot texts and then occur in texts from other regions at a later date, sometimes much later. The vital question is, are these independent developments or somehow related? I have three examples the first of which concerns the words pio and pia. They derive, it's assumed, from pleon uh, and uh, plea, respectively. In a recently published paper, I've explored their uses and forms. In standard modern Greek, pio is used to form the analytic comparative and superlative, while pia is a temporal adverb. In late medieval and early modern Greek, these functions are not clearly distinguished. The unresolved question is when the lambda was lost, or more correctly, when the palatal lateral approximate l uh, changed to y, <laughs> a process not otherwise attested in medieval or early modern Greek. In most of our texts, the forms pleon and plea are used, uh, with possible synesis, uh, which makes them monosyllabic, plion and plia, or plio without final ni, but retaining the lambda, while later Cretan texts usually have blio, adverb, and blia, comparative. The easy way to remember which is blio in Cretan and which is blia is that blio Cretan bia equals modern Greek pia, and you get the point. Okay. Um, it's very useful to have a mnemonic sometimes. That, um, however, in texts from Cyprus, we have a number of occurrences of forms without lambda from Machiras onwards. Comparative forms, ton pion. I think we can assume it would be pion makrin topon, tus pion hamilus, um, uh, piaf colon from the canzoniere, in other words, pia f colon, piasprin, pia aspirin, um, and uh, as a temporal adverb, uh, we have pion uh, in the assizes, um, 
and in Macheras and Bustronios and the Canzoniere. There's only one instance, um, one definite instance really, in a text outside Cyprus, uh, and that's the Anacalima Tis Constantinopolis, a text which may conceivably have a Cypriot or Dodecanesian provenance, then Prepi Pio Nafingis. And then a couple of isolated examples from Andros and Crete dated to the 17th century or later, but nothing from mainland Greece before the 19th century, when it's mentioned with faint disapproval in the dictionary of Scarlatos Byzantios, first edition, 1835. He writes, Pleon, proferate kinos plio. And in the second edition, um, third edition of the, of the grammar, of the, it is a grammar, a dictionary rather, so he, he has pioteron, proferete kinos piotero. The double comparative form pioteros had also been mentioned a few years earlier in the grammar of uh, Schinas. On dit encore pioteros, vulgairement pioteros. So when the forms without lambda, the pia, pia forms, finally appear in central Greek areas in the 19th century, they're labeled as vulgar. The question we have to pose is, are these separate, unrelated developments, or did the new forms that we first encounter in Cypriot texts gradually spread west and north um, to southeastern, other southeastern areas, and, and then eventually to mainland Greece. I don't know the answer. We lack the data. But I'm inclined to think we're dealing with a fast speech phenomenon that is very slow to appear um, in written text, to, to be accepted as uh, suitable for putting in a written uh, text, except in Cyprus. There is something more to say about comparative forms, specifically the comparative degree of the adjective megas. Now, unsurprisingly, the ancient Greek comparative form mison was abandoned in favor of more transparent uh, formations based on the stem megal. The first form to appear is uh, megaloteros, variously spelt, uh, in a 19th, uh, sorry, a 9th century legal text, the so-called Prochiron Legum, which will be known to Byzantinists, I think, uh, preserved in a manuscript dated to the 12th century. This form has a wide geographical distribution up to the 16th century. An alternative formation, megalioteros, um, occurs in our text from the 14th century onwards. Its origin is probably an analogy with Kalioteros. The new form coexists with the older Megaloteros, sometimes even in the same text. But it's soon in competition with another new form, Megaliteros, which is the standard modern Greek form, um, but we find it with a variety of spellings, even today. We find it with a variety of spellings. Megaliteros. Well, it first appeared, you guessed, in Cypriot texts, <laughs> such as the Chronicles of Macheras and Bustronios, often with gemination of the taf, to megaliteron. It's only fair to mention an earlier uh, occurrence in a Rhodian text, in case there are any Rhodians in the audience, roughly contemporary with the composition of Macheras's chronicle. And the evidence shows that the new form is already established in Cypriot texts and perhaps Dodecanesian ones by the time it spreads to a wider area in the 16th and 17th centuries. Finally, the expression basque in case, in the hope that, or lest. Nowadays, widely used in colloquial language, both spoken and written. It's usually claimed to derive from minpa, with a, an adverbial 
sigma uh, attached to the end of it, although there have been other theories, including a, a highly improbable derivation from Albanian, mentioned but not supported by Andriotis in his etymological dictionary. I think we can rule out an Albanian origin because it first appears in texts from Cyprus, where contact with Albanian was rather unlikely, uh, and always with the initial P rather than mi P. Here we are. Paske i rije na kombuthi in Maqueras. Paske apothani in the cansoniere paske varethisme. And another one a bit later, paske um, nakami nasasti tu hazana. Okay. We haven't found this in any non Cypriot text of the period under examination. The Cypriot dialect is often regarded as ultra conservative, preserving elements which have disappeared from other varieties of Greek. Though some of the claims made for the dialect's antiquity are a bit over the top, um, the basic proposition is self-evidently true. Many features of the Cypriot dialect appear archaic to speakers of standard Greek. It's therefore somewhat surprising to identify features which Cypriot possessed ahead of other varieties of Greek, like the three we've just discussed, pion, pia, comparative megaliteros, and the conjunctive phrase baskia. Time for some conclusions. The first ob observation I want to make is that in the period from the 12th century to the beginning of the 18th century, Cypriot is vastly better documented than any of the other outlying dialects, such as Pontic or Cappadocian, and arguably more richly attested than any other regional variety except for Cretan. As for southern Italy and Sicily, while we have an abundance of surviving material, it, it consists mainly of documents from the 10th to the 13th, 14th century, and consequently lacks the wide range of text types and genres that we find in Cyprus. However, the quantity of Cypriot material in the form of legal texts, history, letters, religious, ethical works, poetry, um, is not matched by the quality of the additions or related linguistic studies. To take a few examples, for the Assizes, we're still dependent on the 1867 edition of Sethus, which is far from reliable. A new edition, which homogenizes the orthography and spelling, supplies a glossary and commentary, would be invaluable for scholars of various disciplines. A comprehensive linguistic study is also an urgent desideratum. The recent transcription of the manuscripts of Machiarasi's chronicle is a valuable aid to textual research. But, sorry to say this, but it hasn't yet superseded the edition of Dawkins, 1932 edition. Vustronios, on the other hand, is now quite well served by the synoptic edition of Yorgos Kehaioglu, even if that edition is not particularly easy to use. The recently published edition of the Cansoniere by Giovanna Carbonaro, based on the edition of Siapkara Pizzilidu, incorporates a number of textual and orthographic improvements. Nonetheless, a new scholarly edition, uh, as proposed by Elsie Matthew Pulu Tornaritu in 1993, remains a desideratum. What we also still lack is a detailed linguistic study of the Cansoniere, which would, among other things, help to resolve the vexed question of whether the anthology was composed by a single poet or several pietes. E pietries? More positively, we can point to the edition of the Fjord de Vertu, uh, which is accompanied by a brief linguistic description as well as a glossary. Nonetheless, I can't avoid the conclusion that in general, the existing editions and linguistic studies don't facilitate the study of late medieval and early modern uh, Cypriot dialect to the extent that one might wish. Two questions that I don't intend to attempt to answer this evening 
are the following. First, when did the Cypriot dialect come into being? In the 7th century, 13th, sometime between, according to the proposals of various scholars. It seems to me that the question is unanswerable, and not simply because there's insufficient written evidence. We've no evidence for the spoken language, of course, and very little in the way of subjective perceptions of it. But what's the difference between a dialect and a regional variety, which may exhibit some phonetic, lexical, or morphological peculiarities, but is still readily intelligible to people from other regions where the parent language is spoken? And when does a regional variety become a fully-fledged dialect? These questions take us into the realm of unprovable hypotheses. The second question I'm not going to answer. We know that Old French and Italian, uh, Venetian, augmented the lexicon of Cypriot, but did contact with those languages affect more than the vocabulary? For example, its inflectional morphology or syntax. This is certainly uh, a topic for further research. But there's a final question that I will touch on, necessarily briefly, given the fact that I'm running out of time, and it will enable me to draw together the topics I've attempted to cover. In a paper of 1994, Maria Ciapera concluded that, and I quote, the Lusignan period, by isolating Cyprus from the rest of the Greek-speaking world made it possible for the Cypriot dialect to develop with little influence from the written language. How isolated from other varieties of Greek was Cypriot after 1192? Apart from the fact that modern Cypriot shares a number of features with modern Dodecanesian varieties and some with East Cretan, which can be traced back to late medieval Greek, we can point to some common developments that occurred during the Lusignan period or later. <laughs> um, first, uh, the Eris passive in Ica, first attested in the 13th century, um, Ethimothica in a 13th century poem by Constantinos Anagnostis, who was of Cypriot origin, is one of the very first occurrences of the form, ethimothica rather than ethimothin. We also find ermastica in a 14th century text from Cyprus. For the third person singular, other than verbs in veno, we find ike from the 14th century onwards, including estrafiken and echathiken in Majeras, who also offers us edektikamen, eplerothikete, and exiyithikan, while the assizes have esastikan. The point is that this morphological development is taking place at the same time in Cyprus as elsewhere, though, as elsewhere, the older forms continue to be in use and indeed predominate in older Cypriot texts for all forms except the first person singular. Then the gerund, uh, the indeclinable participle in onda, which acquires a final uh, sigma from the 14th century, Evlepondas in the Chronicle of Morea, the extended form becoming more frequent from the 15th century. Our earlier Cypriot texts have only onda, but from the 16th century we find both forms, Lalondas in manuscript O of Macheras, Thalondas ke kimondas in the Cansoniere, Kathondasmu in the manuscript note of 1574. Again, it seems that Cypriot texts participate in a development that begins elsewhere, in this case probably on the Greek mainland. We've also mentioned phenomena that are first attested in, Cretan, in Cypriot texts before becoming more general. Those three that I've already discussed. These parallels invite some explanatory hypotheses, which might take one of the following forms. We're dealing with developments that began much earlier across the Greek-speaking world, but didn't surface in written form until several centuries later. They were, they were in existence, but they were not found in written texts. So they're inherited, if you like, by 
uh, Cypriot as well as other forms of Greek. Second hypothesis, there was sufficient contact between the urban centers of Cyprus and other regions for linguistic developments to spread in both directions. Third hypothesis, the shared developments are a natural consequence of simplification and or disambiguation and could have occurred independently. They're the result, in other words, of, of, of human nature. Or indeed a combination of these and perhaps other factors. Undoubtedly, Cypriot acquires a range of innovative phonological and grammatical features from the late medieval period onwards, some unique to the dialect, others shared with other regions, as well as much new vocabulary, particularly as loan words. But it also retains much of the inherited structure that it shared with other Greek-speaking areas. For this reason, it's appropriate to study the language of Cypriot writings in the context of a grammar of the entirety of late medieval and early modern vernacular Greek as preserved and documented in the surviving texts. It's to be hoped that the descriptive analysis provided by the Cambridge Grammar will in due course help to bring about what we would all really like to have, a detailed and nuanced historical grammar of the Cypriot dialect. Unanswerable ones, probably. Uh, no, I think so. <laughs> the first one has to do with the um, accusative as genitive, and in the examples that you showed us, uh, uh, you had about one. You had masculine nouns of all dimensions, but you had the one feminine example. Don Nabon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. So something with Kira, wasn't it? So I was wondering how many feminines you got in the sample in the uh, data. Uh, um, well, there are feminine, genitive plural, feminine nouns yeah. all over. But accusatives as genitives? None. 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 It's only masculine. I thought, uh, I thought I saw a couple, in, uh, one in the data, one in the data that you showed us. Certainly in contemporary Cypriot Greek, you don't get it at all. No. Uh, and you don't get all the other declensions, uh, you just get a preference for masculine nouns in os. Ah, no, not um, masculine oh, nouns in is. Ah, yes. tiskira, sorry, it was a gender, so it was a proper gender, sorry, yes. Yes, sure. yeah, yeah. yes sorry, tiskira, yeah, muketus yeah, archondes. I overread it as an accusative, <laughs> being too excited with this, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so it looks as though it's uh, become, it's leveled out from all the centuries, right? It's, only been, it's now restricted only to masculine in us, and this is also subject to leveling, as I've shown in a recent study that I've done, contemporary study. And the other question had to do with uh, the palatalization of yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the the, the, the switch from a, the, the the move from a palatal lateral approximate to, yeah. approximate to a palatal fricative approximately or yod. Uh, it's not very uncommon in contemporary Cypriot Greek to actually get that Malia is Malia and yeah, uh, uh, etc. So okay. And uh, Plerono is Plerono from Plerono or something. So you could possibly. See, see this as argue that this have a general sort of uh, uh, rule, rule that applies, phonological rule that applies. Right. Which is to, to you. Yeah? I, I'm, I'm going to uh, cover myself by saying that I said it's not otherwise attested in late medieval or early modern Greek texts. Now, it may occur in the modern dialect and in other dialects bes besides uh, Cypriot. I, as I said, I'm not a dialectologist. Um, but uh, I, in that period, now it, it may be latent, it may simply not appear in written form, uh, it may be a natural uh, development uh, that hasn't yet um, fully taken place, or it may be subsequent. It may be something that only starts in the 18th, 19th century. Yeah, sure. 
uh, and you find it in the modern, in the modern dialect. What we lack, of course, is, um, well, I, I think we, we lack a lot of this sort of material uh, from the 19th century, um, 18th century, which could help to fill in the, the gap between the, the late medieval, early modern period and, and the present day. Uh, I think um, you're absolutely right, I'm sure, that this change uh, occurs elsewhere, the, the lieu to, uh, to, to ye, maya, if you say maya, how do you distinguish between um, hair and, and magic spells? Um. <laughs> Thank you, David. Um, just a, a technical question. Uh, you, when presenting the, uh, the, the comparative, megaloteros, you presented it in two spelling variants, omega and omicron. Why? Mm -hmm. Because that's what we find in the text. Um, of the period. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to the way it's pronounced. Obviously, there's no difference of quantity by the time we get to the Byzantine uh, uh, period. Um, some editors have chosen to do it with omega, which I suppose would follow the ancient Greek rule that the previous syllable is a short one, so we write it with omega. Others say, "What's th that's, that's totally irrelevant. This is a new form. So they write it in the simplest way with an Omicron. So it's purely editorial. It's an editorial question, not a question of the manuscript. Of? The manuscript. Uh, yes. Well, it, it was a, uh, well, I think if you found that form in, in a text of which you were you would want to go one way or the other. You have to make a decision. It was a, an editorial decision for the, the medieval scribe, but it's, it's also an editorial decision for the modern editor. Yeah? Which way you do it. I mean, if you have inconsistency, and if I was reviewing the edition, I would draw attention to it. Because <laughs> I would expect a modern edition to, to have um, homogenized the spelling. Sorry, it's, it's just a, a nicety. But uh, so if you have two manuscripts and the one has the form megaloteros with omicron and the other with omega, what, what should we do? Ah, well, that's the job of the editor. <laughs> <laughs> it is, surely. You, guys, um, you have both writings in the same manuscript, usually. Yes, yes. That's the thing. Yes. There's no consistency. Indeed. You know, the more the so there's no consistency. Mm. You have all possible spellings. And megaliteros with epsilon, iota, eta, epsilon, yeah. probably. Thank you. Thank you for this excellent lecture. Um, you mentioned the word um, ashimoterus in Leontius Macheras. Today we say ashimoterus mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. because the palatal kappa and he after sigma becomes sh, schini, schini, skilos, schilos. Yeah. The question is whether when they were writing down the dialect they were making homogenizing it within the parameters of the common of, of a com common language um, because it's very strange to read for us today at least as himoterus it should yeah. be aesthetically uh, linguistically and aesthet more aesthetic in the aesthetics of the uh, language as um, but we don't know when it's changed 
For example, on the inscription on the castle of Colossi on the uh, sugar raffinery, raffinery, Pashas in the late 16th century is written Pashas. But I am sure when they were uh, speaking orally, it was Pashas. Yes. So this is a question to know whether they had this complex in inverted commas <laughs> where they were writing down to make it more refined, more academic. Or well, that's, I think that's a part of the story. Um, the other question is, how do you write a sound yes. which didn't exist in earlier forms of Greek? How do you write the sound? Sure, it's, it's a matter of debate even even today in proper names and, and, and beyond. Is the share? Yes. And that indicates... Which, I mean, in my opinion, he, he was either unable to find the, the right, you know, letters to write it, or he was trying to be religious, you know. But that would be surely if he was trying to be uh, learned, he would write it as foresia, for 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 yeah, foresia, foresia, probably. Yeah. And the same problem today: the she, che, je. In Turkish, it exists. In Italian, it exists. They have letters to write it, but in the Cypriot dialect, when we want to write it down, we don't. Have well, these questions are actually examined in the grammar, um, uh, in the phonology uh, section, which was written by Io Manolesu. We have in the text indications of a change which is taking place, has taken place. Some scribes, or possibly some authors, try to find a way of representing it using the 24 letters of the alphabet at their, at their disposal, and sometimes they go one way, sometimes they go uh, the other way. Um, but it's not for us as historical grammarians a matter of aesthetics, it's a matter of analyzing the evidence which is there on the, the page, the manuscript uh, leaf uh, in front of us. And it's true that there are indications uh, that the pronunciation has changed. There are no indications of the pronunciation je, je, as far as I know, uh, at least up to 1700, which is more or less uh, where we stop. So some, some of these changes uh, took place in the period covered by the grammar. Some, we have to say, there is no evidence for it um, in written texts up to this point. But of course, we only have the evidence which has survived in written form. There must, there could have been a lot more uh, written texts, and of course, there is the spoken language which we have no access to at all. So you're absolutely right that this is something that the historical grammarian is looking out for in in the text, and we find indications sometimes, but without any consistency. Thank you very much. As I said, in the case of uh, uh, gemination, um, uh, if they if they spell thalassa in the ancient Greek way, you don't know whether that's they're just the they, they know how to spell with with double sigma, mm -hmm. or they would actually pronounce it mm -hmm. as thalassa. Um, if, however, they they spell um, let's say a word like benno always with vioni, after simenikati, ne? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> which some of which are, are, are published and, and some not. The, yes. the, the, the Livre de Remembrance. What was it? Remembrance. Yeah. 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 Uh, those and in some of the little texts published uh, by Constantinidis Constantin and Browning in the description of uh, Cypriot manuscripts up to 1570. Yes. Yeah, some of those little notes. Mm. 
uh, by a uh, semi-literate uh, a person really give you an insight into the, the, the spoken language. Yeah. And I also Mm. Um, yes, uh, I, I suspect sometimes that they are trying to be very precise in rendering the original French, so that they produce something which is not very natural in in Greek. And sometimes, of course, they explain it, uh, et or whatever, to to give an alternative uh, rendering. Uh, so I think it's some it's a it's a, a text which is important, was important, remains especially important, I think, for uh, historians of, of medieval Cyprus and certainly for uh, linguists. Um, whether we can make any assumptions about how it corresponded to the spoken language of the time is a different matter. I think we just have to be cautious and say, here we have a written text. Oh, this is an interesting form. <laughs> this is, but we can't go beyond it to what they would actually have been saying in the law courts or at the greengrocers or whatever. Yes, thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, first, I would like to mention what I found really interesting in your talk, the fact that sometimes we think that this is particularly Cypriot, which is not. I mean, w we can not find it in other uh, places. But my question um, has to do with your final question, whether it's possible to write this history of the dialect. I don't know if it is possible, actually, because you have so little, the texts are not enough. So would you like to comment on that? Because that these are very few texts. Maybe there are more more bureaucratic <laughs> texts which I, we are not aware of, like the ones uh, our colleague Beihammer has edited. But um, my impression is that with so few texts, maybe it's not possible to to do that. Thank you. Υπάρχει βέβαια μια ιστορία της Κυπριακής διαλέκτου. Έτσι δεν είναι. Δεν την έχω χρησιμοποιήσει σε σημαντικό βαθμό τουλάχιστον. Αλλά υπάρχει, αλλά μου λένε οι ειδικοί πως δεν αρκεί. Δεν μου έχουν εξηγήσει γιατί δεν αρκεί. Χρειάζεται ακόμα μια τέτοια ιστορία νομίζω. Κατά πόσο είναι ε, δυνατό να γράψει κανείς βάση της, του υπάρχοντος υλικού. Δύσκολη ερώτηση. Νομίζω έχετε, υπάρχει αρκετό υλικό. Ε, εκδεδομένο και ανεκδοτό. Έτσι δεν είναι. Ε, αυτό πρέπει να γίνει όσο πιο σύντομα μπορεί. Ε, είναι να, δημοσιευτεί, να δημοσιευτούν τα υπάρχοντα κείμενα πολλές φορές σε καινούρια έκδοση που χρειάζεται. Υπάρχουν εξαιρέσεις, ορισμένες περιπτώσεις έχουμε ήδη κάλλιστες εκδόσεις. Γιατί προς το παρόν για να αναφερθούμε στις ασίζες αναγκαστικά πηγαίνουμε στο, στο ΣΑΘΑ για να ε, αναφερθούμε ε, ας πούμε ε, στο κανσονιέρε. Έχουμε εκδόσεις, αλλά νομίζω μια καινούρια εκδοσή θα άλλαζε τα πράγματα λίγο. Και πολλά άλλα κείμενα που νομίζω χρειάζονται καινούρια εκδοσή. Βρήκα κάτι προχθές. Υπάρχει μια ε, μετάφραση ε, της ιστορίας του Στέφανου Λουζίνιο χρονογραφία ναι χορογραφία υπάρχει μια μετάφραση που γράφτηκε νομίζω στις αρχές του 18ου αιώνα εβδόμου ναι Τότε γράφτηκε, ναι. Α, αλλά το χειρόγραφο είναι από τις αρχές του 18ου. Ναι, συγγνώμη. Και 
διάβασα προχθές ότι αυτό το κείμενο, αυτή η μετάφραση περιέχει αρκετό κυπριακό γλωσσικό υλικό. Αλλά είναι, δεν υπάρχει έκδοση, δεν, δεν είναι προσιτό αυτό το κείμενο για, για, στους επιστήμονες. Να γίνει και αυτό. Και πολλά άλλα που χρειάζονται. Τότε νομίζω θα, θα έχουμε τη βάση μιας καινούριας uh, ιστορικής γραμματικής της διαλέκτου. μέσα του 16ου αιώνα, οι οποίοι προκηρύχτηκαν στα Ιταλικά με άμεση μετάφραση στην Κυπριακή Διάλεκτο, που θα το δημοσιεύσουμε σήμερα. Ναι, είναι... Σήμερα είπα σύντομα. Είναι πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Γράφει ο κρατικό κείμενο, έτσι, διοικητικής φύσεως. Ε, αλλά είναι ενδιαφέρον γιατί είναι ενδιαφέρον και από παλαιογραφική άποψη, γιατί έχει ακριβώς την ίδια γραφή που έχει το Livre de Remembrance, ε, το ε, χειρόγραφο της Ραβένας του Λεοντίου Μαχερά, δηλαδή είναι αυτή η απλοποιημένη ε, ελληνική, μόνο με γιώτα, γιώτα I, ε, ε, λατινικό, ε, ε, ε μόνο, όμικρον μόνο, και υποθέτουμε έναν είδο απλή γραφειοκρατική γραφή. Πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον, ναι. Ναι, ναι, ναι. Ναι, ναι, Μπράβο, ναι, ναι. Δεν σημαίνει ότι ο γράφων είναι απέδευτος. Έτσι. Έτσι δεν είναι. Γιατί μπορεί να ξέρει να γράφει την αρχαία. Αν να γράφει τη διάλεκτο, δεν χρησιμοποιείται το ίδιο σύστημα. Φυσικά. Θα λέγα. Φυσικά. Και εμείς το ίδιο Παιδιά. <laughs> Εγώ τότε να ευχαριστήσουμε τον κύριο Χόλτον.